Right, welcome to New Horizons, everybody. Uh, and a really big welcome to Nigel Mortimer with Opening Gateways. Since 1980, Nigel has been a paranormal investigator. He's come across anomalies, which appear to lead elsewhere, shall we say. Nigel also finds that these are not just a modern occurrence, as references and hints have existed historically. Strangely, government agencies are aware of these gateways or portals. I'm not at all keen on us learning about them. Nigel shares his knowledge like any good investigator and will uncover fresh information on one of these portals in the northwest of England. Please welcome Nigel Waterman. Thank you. Really nice to see you all. What a crowd, you know, amazing. Yeah, that's how you, thank um, you for all, you know, it's a great turnout. Um, just didn't expect this. This, I need to explain this to you, and if I sound a little bit rusty, um, it'll all become apparent why I'm going to tell you what I'm telling you in a second. Over the last year, um, after a charmed life of never suffering any sort of illness at all, since my childhood to being 50 odd years old, last year was hell. I didn't ever think, and this is no exaggeration, that I would be ever stood up here again giving a public lecture on, on the subject I love so much. Um, I'm going to explain to you in a second or two. It's directly connected with the fact that myself and my wife Helen, sat over there, who has been very much involved herself in all of this, um, have been basically hindered, approached negatively, and been cursed to have the free will and the intention taken away from us to actually discover what we're going to present to you tonight. As you can see, I'm still here, so whoever was behind that did not succeed. And I will carry on as long as I can to actually put what happened to me behind me and always bring the information out to people like yourselves who are obviously you know, honest and true, true seekers like myself. We need to know that these things are real and that it's all to do with our future and our free will. The talk tonight um, is called Opening Gateways. Now, I became aware a couple of years ago before it became very ill, that people all over the country, nay all over the world, were basically talking about portals, gateways, um, other dimensions and this type of thing. And because I'm a ufologist for 30 odd years, I've always felt that when people see things that they think are UFOs, nine times out of ten, they have a very psychic element to them, um, in one way or another. And what I found was that manifestations do occur, but they don't always occur in a way that we would like to think they do, like spaceships coming from other planets. And I mean, I really feel that although we've advanced technologically, spiritually, we are quite, you know, back in the caveman days to some extent. When you hear people, and so many people talk about UFOs, interplanetary spacecraft bringing beings here to Earth, Really what we're doing is, and we've done this for years, is really painting onto the phenomenon exactly what we would do. You know, if you look at the history of UFOs, you'll see going back that they're always something slightly ahead of our own technology. It's almost like we're projecting onto the manifestation itself the things that we can understand. But what you're going to remember is we're dealing with something that is non-human, that would probably be really alien. And to think that we're involved in nuts and bolts spacecraft in that. It's quite naive to some extent. So I started to think for some years, well, maybe they're so advanced, these uh, entities that are reaching us, that they could use two different ways of travelling to us. Yeah, I do believe that people do see flying saucers and UFOs, that type of thing, in the skies. I do believe that. But I do believe also that it's to do with the interaction of the mind, that we're actually seeing things that we can understand, projections as such from the actual manifestation itself. But I do think also that some of these entities and UFOs, balls of light, that type of things, do come through into dimensional gateways. And I also believe, you'll see, that this has been known for hundreds and hundreds of years. Okay. What I'm gonna show you tonight, and I'm gonna to have to go through these fairly quickly because we tried to do this talk on Saturday to a smaller audience than today. And it took me three and a half hours, you know, non-stop. So, you know, please excuse me if I seem to be flying through all this stuff. But you can read on there, the ancients were aware of an earth energy grid. 
These portals, without a shadow of doubt, are connected with this Earth energy grid. You'll have read about it in books and magazines and things, that there are energy lines that seem to be connecting certain points around you know, the world. Um, we find, we, one time these were known as eight lines, but to be honest with you, I think the study of that's moved on somewhat, and we can actually call them energy lines now, because you don't just have to have ancient sites on these lines. There are other aspects of them that can actually hold energy. Stone circles are markers for portal energies. I fell into this trap years ago and still do to some extent. You see a beautiful picture, let's say, of Stonehenge. Looks wonderful, doesn't it? And there's all the mystery there. How did they get the big blocks there? And how did they build it? And this and the other. But really, we're missing the point there. The stones are stones, they're markers. It's actually the place itself that's very important where these markers are. Okay? Most of these places, as you probably know, anybody who goes out dowsing or goes investigating at these stone circle and ancient sites, find that there are very, very few in this country, especially, that seem to be activated, seem to have phenomena happening there. Whereas we read old accounts from the ancient past that lots of things happen at these sites. And that's because, like anything, if they're not used and they're not actually appreciated for what they are, they become deactivated. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Human energy, because we have to remember that as well, remember I'm, a lot more of that, about this is in the book, explaining what I'm really going over here. But we're all energy, every single person in this room, everything in this room, that laptop, those chairs, the ceiling, the walls, is energy, that's all. It's energy vibrating at different particular levels of frequency, that's all it is, and science will tell you this today. What's the good news there is, which my guide used to tell me a lot, and it took me a little while to understand, is that if we're all energy, as living conscious beings, there's one thing that science knows about energy. You can never destroy it. You can only change energy, and that's the key to life after death. You will change. Your energy, who is you? Your personality changes, that's all. Never destroys. World government agencies have known about portals for at least 500 years. Now you'll be saying, well, how does he know that? I'll show you the evidence of that in matter of fact. They're not a new phenomenon. They are to most people that have come through, you know, new age circles and people that investigate the psychic or, or the paranormal. But portals and vortexes into other dimensions have been known about by at least most of the superpowers in this world for the last 500 years. So we're going to look at not circumstantial evidence, we could talk about supposing what portals are till kingdom come, that's going to change anything at all, and I've never been into that. I don't know if any of you are aware of this, I've done talks at Pro, one or two of you will know that, where I channel um, a celestial being, who is energy again, just like you and me, called Sharlak, and I've been channeling him for the last 25 years. He brought me a lot of information during the early years about our own history and who we are. I mean, that's another story uh, completely, and I just don't have time to go into that. But, but what he taught me was two very, very important things. One is that whatever you talk about, if it's channeled to you, or brought to you in a psychic way, you do not embellish it. Okay? No matter how it sounds at the time, say it as it is, because that is the truth. You must stick to the truth. And as long as we do stay with the truth, with the information that's brought to us by people that really care about us, not always seen to us, but they really care about how we advance as human beings, then we will progress in the right way. How many times has it been said, you know, that people that try to take the power from what they're gaining for their own personal gain and their own, you know, ego, it doesn't work for long. They're soon found out to be fakes. I've been doing it for 25 years, and each time I've brought information forward, it's been proven, maybe a few years down the line, but historically proven. I'll give you one quick example. Uh, my guy Charlotte told me about that there would be Egyptian artefacts found in Southern Ireland, and this was in the early 1980s. I was amazed at the time, even I found that you know, quite strange, but he started to channel to me um, a, a personage from the Armana period in Egypt, Akhenaten, which started to show me all about what truth was. It was actually known the Pharaoh really knew truth. But to call this really quickly again, I need to sort of move on. Why well, is always telling me off a rambling? But I do need to tell you that, that 
this evidence that, um, that Egyptians did actually migrate at that time to the southern lands of Ireland. We know that the Scottish race, think of the word Scotland, it came from Scota. Scota is the actual Greek equivalent of Meritate and Akhenaten's daughter. She took out a tribe from Egypt and took them to the southern shores of Ireland. She became a priestess there and actually founded with their descendants the race in Scotland. Why do you think today the Scottish know this, that there's no other people anywhere in the world apart from the gypsies that came out of Egypt that the Scottish would always let them freely roam their land. It's because of that connection back to Egypt. Okay, but what I'm trying to show you there is my guide who always shows me that this information can be historically proven. In Southern Ireland, they found a Shibu collar, which is one of the collars you see with all the, um, you know, the, the lovely sort of like uh, leaves around them and things from the Egyptian times of that period in Southern Ireland, under a tombstone. They don't know how it got there. Right, you see the book on the table. This is not a plug for the book. The book's only just come out, and I've, you know, I've been planning this talk for a long time. But the book is really all of the <coughs> evidence, the factual evidence of how this portal is coming to be and how we recognise it, my wife and I. It's called Isaac Newton and the Secret Sundial. And you'll see in a minute why it's called that and why Isaac Newton is so important to all of this. I don't know if any of you know Settle in North Yorkshire, have any of you been there? Yeah, you got it. Yeah, thank you, that's great. Show me, yeah. Lovely place, yeah. I only ever knew of it until the last couple of years that a place I'd go for like a day out. You know, like a, it's a tourist sort of centre really. It's got a massive rock um, that overlooks the town there called Castleburg. And it's used for rock climbing. It's just a beautiful, picturesque place. Now this little map on here is people get this idea about portals, and this is where we go wrong slightly. If I say to you, this is an interdimensional portal, can you say to me how big it is? You can't say, can you? You don't know. Nobody knows how big a portal is. But the vortexes where things come through in portals can be quite small. They can be a couple of yards across, they can be inches across, they can be millimetres across. But the actual portals themselves can be considerably larger, even up to miles across. Uh, this is the portal area that we have in Settle. What is interesting about this area is that you'll see from these lines that are connecting up all these different numbered places that it makes a nice lot of this triangle. But you'll see where that comes into it later. But what I want you to really understand at the moment is the main place in Roman Castleburg is where everything that me and my wife have experienced has happened, okay? The other places like Landcliffe, Diggleswick, Cleetop, Infield and the Falcon are all places that are equally vortexes. They're on ancient sites or the buildings built on ancient sites and they're all there to hold number one Castleburg as a vortex. It's keeping things in balance, okay? If them other places weren't there, the vortex wouldn't work at number one. It would not be known to us. I'll explain as I go along, you'll see how it all maps out. There we are, that's Settle. Just quickly there, it's a big rock, Castleburg, um, known in the Roman times. They used to throw people off the top of their sacrifice. You know, it's had a, had a bit of a gruesome hot time. But if you go around Settle and ask anybody about the portal, they've got a clue, right? Nobody knows about it at all. But there is a tale in Settle that's known to most people called the Settle Sundial. And this, this sundial was known, whatever it was, was known all over England back in the 1600s. It was as famous back then as Stonehenge is today. But if you go around the shops, because I've done this, and you ask the locals, what was the Settle Sundial? Well, I'm going to ask you, because I, I bet you say the same thing, right? Who knows what a sundial is? Okay, who'd like to, to answer that? It's a device for, by telling the time from the sun. Yeah, that's right. It's a device for telling the time of the sun shadow, yeah? Using the sun shadow. Yeah. And normally when we see a sundial today, it's usually some sort of like a semicircular, you know, grid or something with a gnome or a pointer on it that the sun can reflect off, yeah? And that's what everybody in Seppel basically said. said, oh, the sundial was a big round carving on that rock up there. 
and the sun used to come down and shine on it, like a clock face, and we'd know what time it was through the day. I started thinking about that, thought, well, that doesn't make any sense, because the sun actually, when you're looking towards the west there, okay? So, going this way, to my right, you're looking south. North is up there. The sun coming over from the, north, from the south, shining onto the west, would not even go up on that face of the rock where they're saying the sun down is. And that started making me think there's something not quite right here for this tale. I don't think, and I'm absolutely sure now, but I didn't think back then, that um, I was any, coming to settle to do any other than just you know, visit the place like everybody does, because I lived in Keithley, ran a bookshop in Keithley, West Yorkshire, which is about 25 miles towards Bradford and Leeds, away from Settle. And we had no plans, me and my wife, to ever go live there. But a lady called Laura came into the shop one day, I used to do psychic readings in the bookshop, um, through my guide. And she came into the, the bookshop, and, and again, to cut the long story short, but in a short time, it was pretty apparent, she started telling me all sorts of things about when she lived in Atlantis, and who she was and what she had to do. And she told me and Helen that we had to, and she would be able to help us, move to Settle because there was something important going to happen there. Now, at that time, I mean, I, I, again, I'd made no plans. My next project was going to be actually looking at Menwith Hill, to be honest with you, and exposing the UFO secrets of the top secret NSA base there. That was my next project. But it never came about, because we found ourselves very quickly in 2010 moving to Settle. Okay. When we got there, we lived in a beautiful set of, well, it's a flat, but it's within this old uh, 19th century house. And it looks, overlooks the grounds of a place called, you'll see in a second, called The Folly. Now, when we got there, I was a smoker at that time, two years ago. And I used to sit out in the morning and have a cigarette. But then one morning, April, uh, it's about a year later than that, in 2011. But experiences happened, other experiences we went through about 2010 up until then. But I started seeing lights in the sky around the area. And then on one morning I did see this UFO being chased by two military jets. It came across the area and then flew back again. A few weeks later on, I started seeing this white owl appear in the trees. We're looking literally from my door of the house out towards the folly grounds there. Now this owl, like any other owl, a big white owl, apart from one thing, it was over a metre tall. I've never come across an owl species in this country that big. And it had, you know like typical grey light, black alien eyes? It had those as well. And it just sat there, looked a bit, bit sort of as if it wasn't real, it looked a bit ghostly in its imagery, but it just sat there for a while staring down at me. It was enough to make me think that there's something really strange about that particular spot, obviously. Uh, my wife and myself then started having these odd experiences at night where we'd hear these horrendous screeches, noises that just sounded really unearthly. And we, we had common sense, obviously, even though we'd seen these odd things. I started to say to her, well, they're probably just wild animals in the nearby woodland. You know, it's probably some sort of animal that's been caught in a trap, or trying to logically rationalise it all. But it was when I spoke to a neighbour in the flat above who told me, did you hear the noise this night? I said, yes. He says, I've never heard anything like that and I've been living here for 20 years. Totally all like this. <laughs> Whatever is happening in Settle is known to somebody, you know, I'm not saying this is some sort of military helicopter or top secret NSA base helicopter, I'm known to this, but too frequently throughout the last year we get these low flying helicopters that are flying around the area that we know is the purple. And they'll even hover and stay there for a quarter of an hour sometimes just in one spot. And nobody again seems to know where they come from or what their purpose is there. But we've recorded it because you know, this happens far too frequently. They're not day trips out for people. These things are staying there for, like I say, up to quarter of an hour, half an hour, sometimes just hovering over the, what we eventually found out was the portal side. Right, I told you a minute or two ago about the sundial, what people presume it is in Settle, this big round carving on the rock. Then we find these old pictures. Right, if a portal exists in Settle, wouldn't others have known about it too? Yes, logical answer, isn't it? Well, yes, they did, hundreds of years ago. 
I want you to remember that picture there, okay? That's, that's settled that we just saw in all the shops there, but back in the 1700s. You'll see that the rock's still there at the top of the hill, but, I'll try and just put a little pointer on it, but can you see those stones? There's actually four of those, there's another one there at the bottom. They're flat stones coming down the hill with Roman numerals etched onto them, okay? So in the 1700s, that is what is supposed to be the settled sundial. Okay. <laughs> Gets interesting this. Right. In Dr. Whitaker's History of Craven, 1805, he says the summit of Castleburg once formed the number of a room but magnificent sundial. I just want to stop for a second. Anybody that studies stone circles, standing stones, in that period they were always described as rude stones because of the phallic symbolism, okay? So there we go, a clue there, rude but magnificent sundial, the shadow of which passing over some grey cell stones. Again, terminology that we've seen a lot of times with stone circles, the self stones, grey cell stones, grey stones, things like that, yeah? So when I read this, I started to think, this sounds like an ancient site to me. It doesn't sound like a, a carved sundial on the rock. I've heard it so many times be described for stone circles in other parts of the country. But this picture that you've just been looking at was actually commissioned by the British government in 1778 by a guy, Freemason, called Samuel Buck. And he went all around the country then, accurately describing and making sketches and engravings of prominent places that were, you know, to go on the record basically. A bit like we have today for magazines and newspapers and things. It was a bit of a reporter really going around making a record of all these significant places. But the problem we have here is his description that he actually drew for the government and they made an official engravement which they took all the prints from that went in all the books from then on looked nothing like that. For a starter, there's no hill there anywhere to be seen. Can you see the hill there on the tree? That's not there. The stones that come down here, you'll find out in a minute, are nothing like that. Never existed. <clears throat> so there's something wrong with that picture. Okay, wouldn't you think that they're going to make sure that they've got this right? This is probably what was really there. You get hillsides all over the country where you've got these lines of standing stones. And like you mentioned earlier, my friend, that when the sun shines on them, the shadow that's cast gives you a good indication of the time of the day. So that would make a much better sundial than anything else that's been explained there. Think of them flat stones with Roman numerals on. What's going to happen? Is the sun going to cast any shadow off them at all? No. Because this shadow is supposed to have been able to be cast right across the valley. Descriptions are completely wrong. And this is what you do, you find out the information, you channel it, and you do your delving into history and find out what's there. Don't think for one minute that the government of this country and other authorities are into mis uh, information, misinformation as a modern thing. It's been going on for years. This is just another example of it for that time. The clue is when you talk to, when you look at other records of people saying there was nothing like that picture, is that people were saying at the time to Samuel Buck and to the government, there's protest letters, it looks nothing like that. But it never was changed. That picture became the official version of something that wasn't there. Right, so we can see there that they've tried to, you know, cover up in some way something of some significance but we don't know the reason why yet. What I can tell you is, before we move on to this bit, is that within one year, from 1778, when Samuel Book did his um, engraving, to 1779, on record, whatever was there, whatever type of stones with the sundial, had completely vanished in one year. There was no record of it ever being there ever again. No record of where it went either. But we do have a clue because we've got this place in 1679 being built just before that period by a guy called 
uh, Richard Preston, the Preston family are a big family in the Settle area. Again, you do your research, connected with Freemasons. Uh, they own half of the arable lands around Settle, all the farmlands there. But the clue's there, you know, the clue's there to this day. It's like a, you know, a secret in plain sight. It's called the folly. Well, we know a folly is something that it isn't. At the time, of that being built, this road that runs along here, and by the way, I live basically, you can see that building there. I live there. Okay. This building, the Folly, <coughs> was along the main trunk road from the south of the country up to the north. Okay? The only road through the area that we're taking off. So it would be a busy place back in them times. If you go just behind there, you see the bit of woody area up there. Yeah? That's the slope coming down that we saw in the picture of the stones that were on Castleburg. Now when you look at this building, the folly, we know three things about this that are really important. One, the frontage of it is magnificent. If you go to Settle and you see it, beautiful architecture. Lots and lots of effort gone into it. But if you walk down the sides and the back, it's just plain walls. Nothing there at all. You go inside it, plain walls, nothing there at all. She was a bit of a museum now, but, you know, just nothing. There's so much effort gone to the outside and nothing. But we know the other fact is that Preston, right, never lived in it. His family never lived in it. And down the generations, it never became a dwelling place. It looks like a manor house, do not it? All it was ever used for, down right through time from the 1800s, right present day, is various companies took it over. It was actually a timber yard at one time inside. It would go fishing chip shop back in the early 1900s, believe it or not. Things like that, it never became a proper dwelling place, which I thought, again, this is really odd. And it's the name, the folly. A folly is something that it's not. Okay, remember that. What do you think it's doing? It's doing something really, really important. If you're not living it, you're still doing something really important. And that is obscuring the view. Because if you come along that road, we all do it today even, you look at that. You're not bothered by anything else that's behind it. You're never going to be interested in that behind it at all. Because you're too busy looking at that, it was amazing. And that's the folly. How do we know that there are any stones at all on those slopes? Well, luckily enough, and he's my hero, he pulled me through my illness, this guy. When I found this information out, and then he jumped out of the bed, you know, oh, all that, that amazed. It's called John C. Letson, and he became a very, very famous doctor um, back in that time, the uh, mid-1700s, down, uh, down in London, and that, and it, it, it's very, very well known. A lot of the medical practices today look back on his notes, you know, he was a... Um, Definitely a pioneer of his time. But while he lived in the settle area, he actually stayed and learnt his trade, so to speak, um, in the house where I live now. Okay, so we've got a bit of a coincidence going on there. But, and there's the house picture of it there, but called Sutcliffe House. Now, the guy that, that he was working for was a, an apocryphy, was an Abe Sutcliffe. And Abe Sutcliffe, Again, he was a bit of an alchemist as well. He wasn't just an apocryphy, he was, he was delving into all sorts of things. Now, this uh, Letson guy did all these rounds around this part of Settle, it's called Upper Settle, and drew ma a map, thankfully enough, of the area where he goes to the different houses administering his uh, medical care. And on his map, as you can see there, luckily enough, he draws Castleburg Rock. And as you can see there, as you can see better in the book, it's difficult on the slide, but he draws four pointed stones. And he actually states on the map, in that very small writing, four pointed stones. So we're talking here, standing stones. Okay, the ancient connection has been made through that map. And what is weird is, that map was not known to anybody in Settle for a couple of hundred years. It turned up in Ironbridge in Merseyside, in the back of an old house. Unbelievable. Right, so I just want to go over really quickly so you can see where this is mapping out to. There's 300 attempts in the past 500 years to describe the structure of something else. On purpose, misinformation. The actual location of the Sun Dalek Asperg was changed in the 18th century. I'll talk about that in a second or two. Notable worthies like Preston, there's other people that are involved that are Freemasons. 
We're involved in secreting what the truth was about the sundial. Lesson's map shows you there were pointed stones of considerable size on the slopes. Well, right, Richard Preston built the folly. The slopes were covered in dense vegetation. There are trees that date back to the 1600s in there, showing that that slope where these stones were was actually made into a plantation. Again, to obscure the view of what was once there. All right. <clears throat> right. Because I started to understand that there's something hidden about this sundial, I'd been a bit of a dowser, I've been a dowser for years. You know, it all comes in part of the parcel of doing the channeling and using energies and this sort of thing. I decided to get a map of the area and think, well, I know the fall is important in this because I've had some strange experiences taking place there, and I think the fall has been built to cover something up. So I started. And I made that like the centre of everything. But then I thought, well, you know, I wonder if that was an ancient site, there'd be other things that show that, like ley lines. And if I draw a line east and west from there, and north and south, will I get any indication of anything, any other ancient sites? Because as you know, the stone circles, they usually do fall on these energy lines, and you find other stones and wells and things like that. And as you can see on there, I'm amazed, the folly falls on it. We've, we've got a little park, it's a modern park, just a bit further on from the folly, going this way towards the south. And me and Helen took a trip down there. We're there, scrambling these bits of old trees and things at the back of a modern house in the state. Standing stones in a circle. Not on any maps, no books. But they're there, they're sitting in the book. Further along, we find a track. It's where Richard Preston had built the folly. His house is there. And outside his house, an ancient well, right on the line of energy. Following it across, we went on and on and on to a place at the end, which you can't quite see on the map there, called Clee Top. Now, there is historical evidence there that it was a massive, and I'm talking, a massive stone circle on the same sort of dimensions as Castle Rig. It was seen all over the Ribble Valley from its point on top of the hills. It's gone. It's gone. It went in the early 19th century, it's gone. You look at, you can see a trace of some stones that would have been there if you've got that you know, eye to look for these things, but most of it has disappeared. We had some great experiences there, though. The energy of the place, I've said, is important, and we actually got everything to say. But what I need you to see is that equidistant from that place at Castleburg, where the rock is, equidistant both ways, a place is along this imaginary energy line that end up at stone circle sites. It's on this map, and it's in the book, because as I was doing these maps, we were actually working and things were being discovered all the time. There's another line that actually goes east-west, right? In that direction, you'll see at the top there, it says Gigglesbeck written downwards. There's a chapel there we're going to talk about in a minute. You think that Roslyn Chapel holds all the secrets for the Masons? Nothing on this. I could not believe it when I got in that chapel. Here we are, a clean top. <clears throat> you can see it's on a map there, um, it's just showing you the remains of it. As you can see, there's rocks scattered all over the place, so it's very difficult to see the line of where the stone circle would have been now, but these are just natural boulders that are in the area. But what was odd, when we got to there, Helen, who has never ever really um, done any channeling, done anything psychically at the level of where she was projected to, decided once we sort of found the area for the stone circle to impersonate where were it, a, a, a bird of some kind. I stood there and thought, what the heck is she doing? So I got my camera, I thought, well, I'm going to take a picture of her anyway. It looks like daft, you know, I can show her it later. But she's there flapping her arms around and just going round and round in circles. When we got back and I developed the picture, she said to me, actually, on the way back, I felt there's something over my head, I had to do it. We've got the picture developed and you can see that almost looks like on the original that something is breaking through in the cloud cover, it's, it's lower down actually. It's breaking through, you can feel the energy of it when you look at the original picture. Now I want you to try and remember that picture because I've had lots of people, don't get me wrong, I, I always look for the obvious, you know, there's lens flares you can get from cameras, there's all sorts of mistakes we can get with, you know, especially with digital cameras, the processing of them, and I always look at that. But we have in this case, for the first time ever, Proof that that is something paranormal because 
we've actually replicated it. You'll see with completely different cameras and things. You know, I said I had the UFO activity happening. I was looking for UFOs when I came to because I thought that's all it was to do with. I had that sight of the jets and things like that. But the area's been known for them type of phenomena happening anyway. You know, pretty good cases. But I, I have never read of these in any books anywhere. I don't know if you read that, but basically I'll go over it for you. Um, in the spring of 1942, the village is Atlantic, which is about a mile from Settle. It's on that energy line. They actually saw this craft that um, came down at a place called the... Um, I can never remember it. What's the place called, Alan? Antler? No, between it, Settle and there. I, I know it, it's always one of the names. It's on the tip of my tongue, it never comes out right. Barrel Sykes, I knew it would come, thank you. Barrel Sykes, okay, it's called that. And this object came down, landed, and people were, were amazed at it. There was another object that came down and landed in the river that the children were petrified of, and they could feel as if somebody was trying to get out of it. In both cases, the military knew straight away that this thing had landed for some reason, and sent American and British troops to actually overlook what was going on. And can you see what happened there at the end of it? They said that people were hallucinating because they'd been eating um, contaminated bread that had a certain fungus in it. Unbelievable. Just really quickly, Nigel, the technology in 42 detected a UFO in the area. Right? Okay. Do you know about that one yet? Uh, no, it's just fascinating. I right, right, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I've been doing research trying to find out whether these cases are known, and I've not come across it yet. But that's great, Tony, thank you. I mean, it's typical of a, you know, of a CE2, but it's got that element that it ties in directly with the area that we're talking about, yeah? You'll see there's another case here, look, it's on its own. 20 years later, these children say this round object ended up landing in the river. What did they say? The military cordoned off the area and said, it's a new weapon we've got, we're going to be using it in Vietnam. <laughs> Carted the thing away. That's what I was like. And, and also, we're stones throw away from the more famous case. Just up the road, talking a couple of miles away from Settle again, the most famous case, which is in most UFO, modern UFO books now, the I. Bentham UFO abduction case, where, you know, the, the whole family was taken on board a UFO. It seems very, very interdimensional when you, you know, you, you, you read that case where they saw a bright light and then they felt they were being taken in a quasi-conscious reality into this craft. Very, very similar. I mean, it's all the things that you get with these type of encounters, missing time, lost factor, altered emotions. We're getting all of them at the portal, so it's something very similar. Right. Changing the gear now, and this is what is quite important. Science, as you probably all know, I can tell you, you're not all intelligent, so you're not the type of people I'm sure to just, um, you know, be told something and take it online and think. My son's doing physics at Man U Manchester University. And he's told me in the last year, Dad, you'd be surprised how they're trying to rewrite the science books at the moment. You know, it's gone, gone they've been force fed Newtonian science, right, you know, and Einstein's theory. For years now, they're having to actually reevaluate everything. And you'll see why when you realise this. And at the end of that energy line from the, from the uh, sundial that I showed you on the map, there's a place called Langcliffe. It comes right to this hall. Which again is built, the grounds are built on an avenue of stones, right? An ancient stone circle. Sorry, an ancient stone avenue. In this hall was a, back in the day, back in the 1600s, was a family called the Dawsons. And in particular, one of them called, uh, I'll just get the information up here so you can read as I go along, Major William Dawson. His sons actually, his descendants, still live in the hall now. But he was a friend of Isaac Newton when down at Cambridge. And I came across this information, not looking for the portal, it's out of coincidence. I was reading up about the ancient sites in the area, and then there's a local historian called Brayshaw in Settle, who thankfully catalogued all weird and wonderful things. And one of the stories he wrote in there was that Isaac Newton was supposed to be an occasional visitor to Landcliffe Hall. Now, if you read any science books on Newton, or biographies, Newton would never like that. He, he was a quiet guy, stayed in his room in Cambridge, and never travelled the country hardly at all. It's rubbish. That's cover-up. Rubbish. This guy travelled all over the place. He went to see an astrologer in Bradford, and stayed with him for two weeks, 
when you find the information that's in that area, he came to Lankley Fall quite often. And do you know why he came there? Because at the time, and just before it, he had two great passions. One was all the work leading up to his theories, but, and I can't go into all the details because it'll take me ages, but as we know, because there's more information coming out, he wrote much more on alchemy than he ever did science. Okay? All his documents, 200 and odd pages full of it, are now available through the Israeli Library, showing you that Isaac Newton wasn't a scientist, he was an alchemist. Right, that's the first point. What was he doing being an alchemist? Looking for the philosopher's stone, looking for the secrets of life. Do you know that Isaac Newton actually spent years trying to solve the geometric puzzle of Solomon's temple? Have you ever read that? You won't. Do you know that he spent years mapping out Stonehenge, trying to find the qualities of the astronomical alignment? Never read that before. All I know is, didn't he discover gravity or something? He used to come to Lancliffe because when he brought out his scientific treatise, which projected him into fame all over Europe, called the Mathematica Principia, right? It was so ahead of its time that very, very few people anywhere in this country could understand what he was on about. The only person that Newton said that could was William Dawson of Lancliffe Hall. There we go, look. How of Isaac Newton's papers? They're in Israel. All his writings on working out King Solomon's temple and why it holds sacred geometry. It's got nothing to do with science. Well, it has got a lot to do with science, but not the science that you're being fed year after year. I love this. Newton's third law. Right, you get out of the science book and it basically says what it says. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. But I could have put that into the secret. Couldn't I? Because for every action you give out, you're going to get it back. It's the same type of philosophy. His mind worked in that way. You know, we know, like I said there, that he was a very spiritual man. He was a seeker of truths. He wasn't just a scientist. You've got to go back to that period, the mid-1600s. Science wasn't the science we have today. It was a mystical revelation. The only thing is, the authorities said, if you go down the road of alchemy and find out too many, you know, too deep a secret, you're, it's heresy. You end up on the bonfire. So most of what he did in his time was kept within a small envelope of people which they called the Invisible College. There were other great minds who were involved in this at that time. And Newton was accessing, that's the word, when you look at all his documents, he's accessing from somewhere information that nobody else on this planet knew at that time. And I'm jumping about a bit because I mean, there's so much in the book that brings all this together, it's difficult, you know, to, to do it all tonight, to do it justice. But, as I said to you, my, my idea was that I was going to go down the line of working, you know, with the UFOs that men were filled. But little did I know, it was all part of the Paul thing. Because I did break off to look at what was at men with hell, expecting to have rumours about underground bases, and years ago I was told by a guy that had gone in there to get lagging around the pipes, they could take enough lagging in there that would cover the whole of the 20 odd, 30 odd miles when you've only got six miles on the surface. So he thought that all these pipes were underground. I thought I'd talk about these sort of like, you know, UFOs in these subterranean places, that sort of thing. But it wasn't. Because when I looked at the maps of the area, and you'll see on the next one, you can see there that in the area of the base we've got a place called Round Wood. There we go, 1889. Right, maps 1900 coming right up to date, progression. The 1889 one, it's a ring of stones. It's a stone circle. Then you get, the stones are disappearing, you get this tumulus that's built up around the stones, and a wood built onto it called round wood. The actual stones had a name in the 1800s called Tibby Billings. Okay, it was a known stone circle. Now, think about this. What's the connection there? We've got an ancient site again. An ancient Neolithic site, or sort of megalithic really, site. People have said to me, and this is what's really odd, Memory Fell 
right? To most people, if they say, what's moving the they'll say it's a top secret, the worst word, top secret, NSA run, base, right, listening base, built on British soil, it's actually run by the RAF, but it's an NSA American base that is listening in, and everybody, everybody knows that, I know that, because they're told that all the time, that it's a top secret base, but you all know what it does. <laughs> That's how top secret it is, amazing. Oh, they're listening in. Cold War, the 60s, we're top secret, but what we do is we're, we're actually here so that when they're sending these continental missiles, of course, we're an early one. It's rubbish because they tell you the secret, it's not top secret at all. Back in the sort of early 90s, Dispatches, TV programme, did a, did a thing on these women, the peace women at off plate, that's just below Memberville, were allowed, this is unbelievable, allowed to, with wire cutters, get through the perimeter fence of this top secret NSA base. Run across about 200 yards of open ground, go into an unlocked building and find top secret black budget folders of what they do at Menwith Hill. And get them under the, in the pocket and get back out again. And then, not only that, take them to the BBC and get a programme done on it all. Unbelievable. Because I'll tell you, if you're going away near that perimeter fence, within 20 seconds of being there, or if you go inside it, you better duck. Seriously. You get arrested. I've been arrested myself back in the 80s. You had no way you'd get anywhere near that. That was all part of the disinformation. They'd been threatening that they were trying to get this information about what they really do at Memorville for weeks and weeks. And they really thought they'd found the secret there. Tony knows this better than anyone. You know the conspiracy stuff he's been doing recently. The thing is, if you try to get any of that information, right, which is above top secret, onto TV, a D notice is put straight on it. It'd never make it anywhere out there to the public. But it did, because it was meant to. So that all of us can say, we know what they do at Memory Fail. Believe you me, it isn't just, I don't say they don't do any listening in, but that isn't its main reason. It's the cover of that. That's what they want you to believe. You can see it's built on an ancient site. And I used to think this, it was another thing, you think, why would you build a top secret base that you don't want anybody going into with threat of life if you do try to break into it, right? Why would you build it right next to a busy road between Skipton and Harrogate, the A59, where everybody can see it? When in the general area, there are places hidden away, moorlands and things that are miles away from anywhere. I'll tell you why. It had to be built there because of that stone circle. Rangwood today, you've got the ray domes. All that's in them golf balls are satellite dishes. We know that. Yeah? But it's strange, isn't it, how where that building is on the map back then was a stone circle and that is the end of the first half. What I'm going to show you in the second half is the physical evidence. I hope, I hope I've sort of brought you into where we're going with this, but you're going to see the physical evidence that connects the ancient sites with the actual portal that is activated today that me and my wife have actually gleaned evidence, video evidence of the beings that actually use it. Okay, thank you.